Welcome to Meet the Experts. This series is brought to you by the Patient Library and Welcome Center. Before we start, the content in this presentation isn't intended to be medical advice, and viewers should consult with their physician should they have any medical questions. Viewers should not rely on any of the information contained in this presentation for any immediate or urgent medical needs. And if you think you might be having a medical emergency, please call your physician, go to your nearest emergency department, or call 911 immediately. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care because you watched this presentation. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Our first speaker will be Dr. Galligan. Dr. Galligan currently sees patients in Moffitt Survivorship Clinic, and he has a specific focus on AYA cancer patients and survivors, which he's been focusing on since 2016. He also serves as the co-medical director of inpatient pediatrics at Tampa General Hospital. And Dr. Donovan, who is a clinical psychologist and senior member in the behavioral medicine section of uh, Moffitt's supportive care medicine department. Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, and we're really happy to talk about this topic, um, especially it's such an important topic that a lot of times patients and and or caregivers and or kind of um, providers are a little uncomfortable discussing. So um, we're going to kind of jump into this. Um, like it, kind of the disclaimer said, if there's any questions, you can always bring it back to, to meet the experts or also even kind of discuss it with your own kind of provider and clinic as well. I put a few different questions that a lot of our patients will bring up, especially in the survivorship clinic when I'll meet with them. And you can see them here about, do you have any intimacy and self sexual health questions, um, discussing body image issues and kind of, kind of being intimate while receiving cancer treatment. So some mm -hmm. of these topics are ones that patients will bring up, but a lot of times they might be uncomfortable to bring them up as well. So we're going to get into kind of how to address those questions and how to maybe bring them up to your um, healthcare team, um, you know, during your cancer treatment or beyond. All right, so I wanted to start with a little bit of a, you know, a definition about sexual health because there's lots of different definitions out there, um, and especially related to kind of how sexual health relates to kind of cancer treatment and beyond as well. So you can see here, this is from the World Health Organization, um, kind of in the early 2000s. So uh, from this definition, sexual health is a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. This is not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. Sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. For sexual health to be attained and maintained, the sexual rights of all persons must be respected, protected, and fulfilled. So this is kind of a big, you know, big definition. Obviously, it covers even beyond just sexual health related to kind of cancer care and cancer patients, but it's good to kind of have at least kind of what's involved with sexual health to kind of start our journey. So why is this topic really, really important? And, you know, this is one that we, you know, hear a lot about and sometimes in the, you know, from the provider side, you know, we're really interested in learning more about this and there's lots of different research going on, but it's one of the most common um, side effects that's, you know, kind of out there for cancer patients. And not only being one of the most common ones, it's kind of the more distressing ones where, you know, you're thinking about trying to get through this big journey of, you know, kind of battling, getting, you know, diagnosed, hopefully getting cured with cancer. And it's one that maybe isn't at the top of your mind at the start of therapy, but as you get further along and further along, or in my world, you get to that survivorship phase, it's one that definitely comes to the top as you're starting to kind of form new relationships, new kind of um, your own journey as you kind of move forward um, with your own cancer care itself. So it's definitely one that can occur in all different kinds of cancers. It's not just a reproductive cancer. So it's not only related to ovarian or testicular or prostate cancer. So it's one that we can see throughout all the cancers. So it's definitely one that touches on all of the cancer care that we would see. But yet there's you know, a lot of times it's really hard to know kind of when to seek out professional help or when to bring it up to your provider. A lot of times it's because of lack of time to answer questions during your visit. A lot of times too, it's the professionals don't get really trained a lot of times in sexual health and have the training to ask questions or feel comfortable asking those questions too. And so it's definitely one that hopefully with this talking with others, it'll kind of bring you to the spot where, you know, you feel a little bit more comfortable and addressing these concerns and hopefully kind of bring that to your provider's forefront so that way they know that this is a concern that's really important to you. So the impact of cancer um, kind of on sexual health. Related to this is 
there's lots of things that cancer can, um, you know, do related to our own sexual health. Uh, it's not just actually having sex and feeling comfortable and feeling, you know, pleasure from sex, but there's so many different things that go along with cancer journey itself. So self-identity is probably one of the big ones because your identity itself becomes a little bit shifted and a little unfocused as you're going through your cancer journey. You're focused on not only, you know, the cancer itself, but all the different side effects and maybe sexual health might be a little bit on the lower priority until you start to feel a little bit better. Again, a lot of the physical symptoms you can have from them, you know, if you're feeling sick, nauseous, lack of appetite, lack of sleep, there's a lot of things that really can impact on it and not make you not feel at the most, you know, the, the spot that you're really, really interested in either going forward with sex or kind of, uh, you know, looking forward to having sex as well. I put in their quotes, new normal. And a lot of, um, you know, kind of clinicians out there and providers will talk about the new normal related to kind of having had cancer and going through that cancer journey. Your life is never going to be the same as it was before you had cancer. But sometimes that new normal can be good and even different kind of throughout um, your own journey itself. And so kind of figuring out what your new normal is and how that's going to impact on your sexual life is one of the big functions that you'll have to kind of encounter as well. Quality of life and stress. So obviously it kind of relates to some of the physical symptoms and your identity throughout it too. With having had cancer, that can affect lots of different aspects of it, related to the quality of life, stress, your mental health, and that all can impact on kind of how you're going to process and look forward or not look forward to having sex. And then I put in there COVID-19, um, especially since we're still, you know, kind of going through the whole COVID-19 pandemic and trying to figure that out too. That's made having relationships and getting to know people dating, having, you know, you know, kind of those close encounters with individuals that we might want to have sex with or have like a sexual, you know, kind of a, you know, kind of a romantic or different other kinds of relationships with a lot harder than before. And so it's definitely still impacting on our sexual health experience for cancer patients. So related to kind of what we mentioned a little bit about sexual health, sexual health and quality of life, um, there's been lots and lots of different studies out there showing that Patients that have um, kind of sexual problems related to cancer have a lot of different impacts on their quality of life and on their mental health. So it's been associated with poor quality of life and depressed mood. And it is one of the more important valued kind of um, features that patients and their partners care about. But yet it's one of the ones that it's a little bit harder to feel comfortable for some patients and their caregivers or their partners to kind of bring up during those topics, during those times. And like we said, kind of on our previous slide, sometimes that lack of time or lack of training from the healthcare professionals is one of the big kind of limiting factors in that avenue. And definitely treating the sexual problems definitely will generally reduce the general distress levels and make kind of that, you know, partnership between the care team a little bit more, um, you know, aligned and kind of closer together and also help the patients feel like they're getting, you know, even more out of their overall cancer journey as well. So related to the common sexual health kind of concerns that people bring up now, a lot of people will focus on the top kind of bullet point there in terms of fertility as kind of the, the first thing that people think about when they hear about sexual health concerns. And while fertility is a really, really big um, topic that we, you know, focus on and we discuss and probably could have another um, one of these meet the experts or lectures about fertility it's definitely not the only thing that we have to focus on. And so fertility is one of the ones, obviously, before you start any kind of therapy that your healthcare team will kind of talk to you about in terms of different things related to, is this kind of treatment gonna cause any problems with fertility? Am I worried about fertility? Am I you know, eager to kind of preserve fertility for the future related to whatever cancer and cancer treatments that I have? Um, beyond that though, there's a lot of other things that can kind of come up with sexual health concerns. Chief among those is sexual, sexual function. And related to that is the desire, pleasure, enjoyment, and or pain were related with having sex. And so sometimes depending on the kind of treatment, the kind of cancer, the kind of you know quality and side effects that you're receiving from all those different treatments, it can really impact on, you know, do you even want to have sex or can you have sex? Or it, I want to have sex, but it really is causing me a lot more pain than normal. And so some of those things are really, really important to kind of discuss and bring up. Related to that is, you know, things with, you know, lubrication, either, you know, not having enough lubrication or how to add to that lubrication to be able to have sexual function, orgasm and, eject, and erectile dysfunction as well. So different things that can kind of really limit and or cause problems with having sexual 
kind of functions that you were either normally having before having had cancer or that have been really kind of impacted by your cancer treatment itself. Um, urinary and bowel incontinence, well, you don't necessarily think about it as quote unquote, a sexual health kind of concern. It definitely can impact on it too, just because both our urinary and our gastrointestinal kind of symptom or our tracts or our organs are kind of in that same area as our sexual you know, health organs as well, or sexual function organs. And so any problems with having problems with maintaining, you know, your bowel or your bladder continence um, in terms of holding your bowel or bladders, it can really impact on it too and make it really an uncomfortable situation if that's, you know, causing concerns with your partner or with a loved one that you're engaging in sex with. Your appearance and body image kind of go hand in hand. So obviously with kind of cancer treatment, you can really impact on who we are as a, you know, kind of a person, who we are as a individual and our body image and looking at ourselves in the mirror and just, you know, it really impacts on a lot of those factors. And, you know, it can really be distressing, cause a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, and it might make people not really want to engage in sex or really think about having sex. Or if you do want to have sex, would someone find you, you know, attractive or pleasurable? And it really can be really distressing in that regard as well. And then getting into relationships and another of those, it's another kind of a large topic that could go on and on in terms of another meet the experts is, you know, not only the sexual relationship, but like the dating friendship relationships too. And that can really be impacted by, you know, kind of how you're feeling, different treatments, who's there for you to kind of support you. And, you know, especially as you get out from the kind of active current cancer treatment to like more of a survivorship world, like how to feel more comfortable interacting with individuals that, you know, maybe don't know you've had cancer or when to tell them that you've had cancer and when to kind of move forward with having more of a, you know, from a friendship to like kind of a more romantic kind of relationship as well. So these are definitely common concerns that we hear a lot of in our kind of, um, you know, survivorship clinic and beyond. With that, this slide shows different kinds of um, sexual dysfunction symptoms and different, you know, kind of males and females. And you can see there's a lot of different things we've kind of talked about in terms of desire, pain, issues with, you know, vaginal dryness in terms of lubrication, maintaining an erection, like erectile dysfunction. And then on the left side too, kind of some just general kind of complaints as well too, in terms of tiredness, fatigue, kind of mental health related to depression and anxiety, feeling pleasure. And so this is just kind of showing in a different kind of graphical way that there's lots of different um, symptoms out there. And while some might be very kind of centered on like kind of you know, female, male, or sexual health kind of concerns, there's also lots of general concerns that can really impact on our sexual dysfunction as well. A lot of times patients will also bring up, and also their partners as well, bring up kind of concerns about sexual or safety with sexual activity. And a lot of this occurs mainly during therapy, but even after therapy and in, in terms of, in the kind of the survivorship or the surveillance kind of therapy where we're, you know, doing scans to ensure that the cancer is not going to come back. So it's definitely one where um, people will bring this up and have concerns. Above and beyond, the great majority of patients, cancer patients and survivors can be sexually active. So it's one of those ones where, you know, it's not, a, you know, you can never have sex while you're, you know, undergoing cancer therapy. It's just kind of figuring out how best to do it, when's the right time, when you feel um, you might have the, you know, the desire and the need to it. And a lot of it can be working with your partner um, on a kind of a close basis to kind of figure out what's the best kind of method to do it in. So sometimes sex can, you know, safe, sex might not be safe during kind of brief periods after kind of pelvic um, radiation, during sometimes surgical recovery, definitely during severe immunosuppression where the blood counts, like the white blood cell counts and the platelets are extremely low, and or if there's any bleeding from any like genital tumors or sores. Those are generally kind of kind of uh, no-goes in terms of sexual activity. Um, good thing, um, you know, cancer cannot be sexually transmitted. So it's not one where if, you know, I have cancer and I engage in sex, the other person is not going to develop cancer. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those ones where we can take that off the board and kind of dis, you know, dispel that kind of, you know, that belief too. Um, it's definitely that important to have safe, safer sex to prevent sexually transmitted infections during times of immunosuppression, but also in general, it's, it's good to use some kind of protection so that way you're engaging in, in the safest sex that you can possible. So especially when your immune system is really low that you're not, you know, adding, you know, increased risk of developing a certain kind of infection. 
right now there's no clear evidence um, in terms of how much or what kind of amount of chemotherapy is secreted in different kind of secretions. So things like saliva, mm -hmm. semen, or vaginal fluids. There are some reports that say that these secretions can last up to you know two to three days after treatment. So a lot of times people will use a condom for oral sex or intercourse, either vaginal or anal sex during that period to prevent your partner from being exposed to chemotherapy. So th there's a lot of data out there that's, you know, kind of speculates on things, but that's probably the most kind of just general safest approach. But again, it's something that you could definitely talk to your current kind of physician or provider about to see kind of if they have any specific instructions for you regarding kind of sexual activity and those different kinds of fluids or secretions too. And then definitely being um, sure that you're using some reliable form of birth control to prevent pregnancy. So even if you think your periods have stopped or you think that fertility has been affected, it's definitely one of those ones where patients can get pregnant during chemotherapy or during some kinds of um, cancer therapy itself. And, you know, a lot of times cancer therapies and different, you know, radiation and other treatments can be harmful to a developing baby. And so it's one of those ones where doing anything you can to prevent pregnancy during is probably the, the safest approach to kind of take. All right. And with that, what I'll do is I'm going to go into a few different of these different side effects related to different, different treatment effects themselves and how they would impact on the individual itself. And you can see here with this little graphic, there's things from surgery to chemotherapy to radiation, to hormonal, to kind of just non- specific kind of treatment side effects. And we'll go through a few of these to kind of show how, what risks are out there and kind of what to think about when you're working with your medical team, but also your, you know, your partner or other caregivers that you're working with. So related to surgery, there's lots of different effects. And obviously it depends on the area that you're having the surgery and, and what kinds of surgery, if it's the surgery for a cancer tumor, or if it's a surgery for, you know, some kind of, you know, like a port or some other kind of surgery for like, you know, a feeding tube or things like that too. So a lot of it depends on the actual site of the surgery. So you obviously can have body change images related to the surgery, um, especially if it's a, a larger kind of surgery, if it's, you know, affecting a limb or a larger part of the body itself, or an area that's going to be maybe observed during, you know, sexual practice as well. So body image changes can definitely occur. Lots of different issues that relate to kind of pain, numbness, and skin sensitivity of the area itself. And then again, some areas, and we put on the, the right side there, certain areas related to more of the genital urinary system. So menopause symptoms, vaginal issues, erectile dysfunction, changes with kind of orgasm or ejaculation, especially if the surgery is related to, you know, kind of the area of the genital urinary system, like the, the testicles, the ovarian function, anything related to them in that region. And then again, issues like we mentioned before about urinary or bowel incontinence, like not being able to hold or control your, uh, your bowels or your bladder. Um, and especially if you, you know, have to have like a, you know, either a feeding tube or different kinds of ostomies like bags to hold our urine and stool, that can really impact on kind of our sexual health and sexual functioning related to kind of a surgical kind of procedure. Chemotherapy, and this slide is very kind of large in terms of different symptoms, and this is probably only a small snapshot of what could be, a, a, you know, kind of anticipated or expected from chemotherapy. And again, not every patient will have a lot of the, all these side effects. And each patient, depending on the kinds of chemotherapy, might have a range of these side effects. But you can see this, it ranges from things like, you know, nausea and vomiting, appetite changes, to problems with mouth sores or immune system issues or issues related to kind of bleeding and bruising um, over time as well. Kind of centered on kind of the sexual health organs itself, like we mentioned. So decrease the desire, pain with intercourse, depending on kind of um, what kinds of chemotherapy agents are there can definitely occur too. Um, and again, from working with patients in the survivorship clinic, there's a wide range of kind of um, side effects that we see from chemotherapy and not each one patient is the same, um, but they can definitely, you know, be helpful to kind of understand what side effects to anticipate. So it's definitely one of those ones where speaking with your provider about the different chemotherapy agents that you're receiving, because they can go over specific ones that are either more common or ones that they are going to be kind of telling you to kind of watch out for as well. Again, side effects from radiation. So again, it, like we mentioned before, a lot of it depends on the area of the body that you're having the radiation in. But one of the big things with radiation is a little bit different than surgery or chemotherapy is kind of skin changes. So wherever the radiation is occurring can cause changes with discoloration of the skin, thickening of the skin, 
um, quote unquote, like a burn almost to the skin, kind of redness and some sensitivity of the area. And so it's definitely ones where if you're getting radiation, you know, in areas where, you know, the kind of around the kind of the genital urinary area, abdominal area, leg area, it could be impacted depending on what kind of sexual activity that you're, you know, kind of, you know, going to be engaging into. And again, there's lots of other kind of side effects with radiation and a lot of it depends on the area of the body that's going to be given into. So not saying vomiting, fatigue, kind of appetite changes are definitely occur, can occur as well. And then even things such as swelling of the arms and legs or saliva changes if you're getting radiation to kind of the head and neck area can occur too. So it's definitely another one of those ones where asking about the part of the body and what one, what kinds of side effects you anticipate from the radiation would be really helpful, especially when you're working with our fantastic radiation oncology team. From hormone therapy, so you can see the side effects in you might be noticing like a kind of a repetition in terms of the side effects from different kinds of, um, you know, kind of sit, you know, different tr treatments themselves. And there's a lot of repetition and it's hard when patients are undergoing multiple different types at the same time or congruently, because you're getting these side effects that are kind of building and building and building on each other. And that can cause really severe side effects from developing. Specific to the hormone therapy too, you can see lots of changes with hot flashes, mood changes and pain. And so it can affect like, you know, if you're feeling really hot and having problems with your moods fluctuating or changing too, that can really impact on, do you even want to have sex or can you have sex or is it going to be pleasurable enough? And so that's really, really important to kind of look into as well. Other things related to it too, in terms of desire for sex, difficulty reaching orgasm and even vaginal dryness. And I know Dr. Donovan will go into some of the um, kind of talks here on her, the second part of the topic in terms of some of those kind of concerns and what, you know, kind of what's recommended and what she's done in the past with other patients as well. And with that, I think I'll lead it over to Dr. Donovan to kind of continue on with this, uh, this journey. Thank you guys. So um, thank you, Dr. Galligan. Um, you've done a really nice job of, of really covering the waterfront um, of the, the, the sexual health effects of the various treatments and um, what I'm going to do it, not only that, but have, have hinted at some of the, the things that I'll talk more about uh, in a little bit of detail to, um, to provide some guidance, maybe some direction on how to uh, address some of the problems that, that we've identified uh, during the presentation. The first thing I, I, I will ask you to do, though, is to think kind of broadly about um, the sexual problem and the factors that may be contributing to those sexual problems. Again, Dr. Galligan did a really nice job of identifying the various problems. What I do um, as a psychologist in the work that I do with patients is ask them to take a, sort of a bird's eye view or take a step back and think about some of the things that may be contributing, uh, for example, to a, a lack of sexual desire. It, it, uh, it may be pain and fatigue that's contributing. It might be certainly medications. When we think about sexual satisfaction, um, are there some other factors that are influencing a person's experience after cancer, for example, it may be that they have to sort of broaden their sexual repertoire and that bumps into some of societal taboos or cultural taboos that that may be that may discourage different uh, sexual activities. So again, just asking people uh, to think very broadly about some of the factors that may be contributing to sexual problems. And when I work with patients <clears throat> around these these factors and these problems, uh, one of the things that I'm very quick to emphasize is that uh, a sexual problem really is best addressed as a, a couple's problem. So when we think about that, um, involving uh, the partner, the, uh, anticipating what a potential partner may have concerns about or what have you, is, is a way to begin to anticipate or to address those problems. So what I, again, with an emphasis on, on, okay, how can we address, we've identified what the sexual problems may be, um, how can we begin to address those? And I encourage patients to, uh, first and foremost, seek some reassurance that the, the problem is not unusual. Um, in fact, uh, I'm always struck when I hear a, a patient say, oh, you know, I, I didn't realize that this was common. I thought I, I thought there was something with me that, that that made it uh, uh, unique to me or something. And, and that absolutely is, is 
I, I would have to say, honestly, 100% of the time that, that the problems that are identified really are not unusual. As you can see from Dr. Galligan's presentation, it's well documented in the literature that, that these problems really are very common as a result of the various therapies and, the, and cancers as well. And then also seek out some information about potential problems and their causes, uh, absolutely. And then specific suggestions for overcoming those problems. Uh, certainly referral for medical testing and treatment. Um, in the training that I did as a psychologist, one of the things that I learned very early on was it was always necessary to rule out the physical, meaning in, in not in, in, in my role, certainly that as a, a non-physician, it's not my place to do that, um, but to, to be aware that oftentimes there are physical reasons um, for these problems and they need to be addressed. Uh, first and foremost, evaluated medically and then addressed perhaps in a medical setting. Uh, and then I kind of come in after to sort of round out um, how to address those problems. And then brief counseling and our intervention. So again, that's the sort of thing I do. And I'm going to talk you through some of the things that I do with patients when I'm counseling about uh, counseling them about some of these problems. So the first thing that I, I will often do is, is really just some basic sex education. Again, even just normalizing the problem, telling them that it's a common problem among, among people who've had radiation therapy or chemotherapy or particular kinds of surgery. And then as Dr. Gallen's already uh, suggested is, is this new normal that appreciating what's changed, uh, not only uh, with respect to sex and intimacy, but for the individual as a whole in their roles as a, a partner, as a wife, as an employer, or, or as an employee, um, wife, mother, parent, um, husband, obviously. Um, suggestions then for managing these changes. Uh, and then ideas for sexual activity, overcoming some physical impairments. Um, and I'm gonna offer you some of those things today as well. And then information about specific therapies uh, that, that directly address some of the sexual problems we've already identified. So that, that first piece, that sexual education, um, often just having um, a better understanding of your own anatomy, what's changed, um, sexual response cycle. When I talk with patients, I, I ask them specifically about their own sexual response. And so when we think about this cycle, we're talking about sexual desire, arousal, lubrication, uh, uh, orgasm, has it changed? Is it, is it, uh, are you still able to have an orgasm? And I'll walk patients through their own response cycle to get a better sense, and for them, obviously, to have a better sense of uh, their experience post-treatment uh, relative to pre-treatment. And then certainly the effect of disease or treatment on sexual functioning. Again, Dr. Galligan's done a nice job of reviewing those things, the role of hormones. Um, what I have learned over time is that we know some about the role of hormones in our sexual health but uh, and emotional well-being, but that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. And then of course, the effect of aging uh, and menopause for uh, on sexual functioning. Um, one of the things that people sometimes forget is that while all of this is going on, their body is, is aging, uh, sometimes more rapidly perhaps than had they not been diagnosed and treated for cancer. But even in the general population, there absolutely are changes over time just as a function of, of aging. So again, when we talk about hormones, one of the things that, that uh, is, is absolutely a, a a highlight, if you will, is the menopausal symptom in, in women. Um, and this is in, in simply a primary ovarian failure um, for a lot of uh, women undergoing treatment for uh, breast cancer, for example, or gynecologic cancers like endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, that premature menopause um, will exacerbate symptoms of uh, or will, will induce symptoms of, of menopause prematurely, or we have the hormone therapies uh, for um, breast cancer that will exacerbate uh, menopausal symptoms. In fact, for postmenopausal women who's uh, been through menopause, they may find that they're again having hot flashes and night sweats, something that they hadn't had for several years. I've listed those there and um, one of the things that, that we don't often talk about, and yet had, it has been mentioned today, is 
um, not just decreased libido, uh, vaginal atrophy, but urinary incontinence and recurrent urinary tract infections as well. Uh, the other thing, this is not necessarily specific to women here. Um, in men who are on androgen deprivation therapy for uh, prostate cancer, they will also experience hot flashes, night sweats, uh, mood changes, irritability, weight gain. Um, anecdotally, I will tell you that when this happens in men, some of their uh, partners, their wives may uh, sort of chuckle and say, okay, now he, he's experiencing the thing that I experienced, you know, years back. So when we, we do bump up against those symptoms, some of the things that may be helpful in addressing those symptoms, things like avoiding spicy foods, caffeine, uh, sleeping in a cool room, rhythmic breathing, exercise has been shown to be helpful. Some patients share, share with me that when they exercise, they're sweating anyway, so they're less likely to uh, notice that they're sweating or that they're having a hot flash. There's some evidence that acupuncture can be helpful. Uh, pelvic floor physical therapy, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but that can be useful in addressing uh, urinary incontinence. Um, low dose antidepressants can be helpful in reducing the frequency and severity of hot flashes, and that's also the case with uh, antihypertensive medications. Uh, so again, just some suggestions for uh, minimizing or mitigating the menopausal symptoms uh, that many people experience as a result of cancer treatment. Um, the other thing, too, that I emphasize that we've heard a little bit all, uh, about already today is that uh, that sexual health has changed. There absolutely are differences. Um, something that I hear from patients, I just just yesterday heard, you know, I don't feel, I'm not me. I'm, I'm not the me I used to be. I want to be back to me. And the thing that I will often do is pause and work with a patient to process the, the notion that things have changed, that, that it's, it's not likely um, that, that the person has changed. And so this idea that they wanna be the person they used to be, um, it's, it's not really gonna happen. And for those of you who have children, you'll appreciate this, I think, uh, or nieces and nephews, you can recognize this as well, that you know, can you think back to when you didn't have children or can you think back to when your nephew wasn't here in the world? And they, they sort of pause and say, you know, it was so life changing. And I think, well, you know, cancer is a lot like that. Um, and as a result of that, sexual health has changed. Those changes impact our, our, um, ourselves as individuals and, it's, and certainly sexual health as well. So it isn't though always about sexual function. Um, it isn't always about the sex though. It's often about the attitude towards sex and intimacy that affects their relationships. So if they say, you know, that's, um, uh, it's an, it's important to me and it's an important part of my quality of life, then they're, a person is more likely to want to tackle, more motivated to tackle these issues. If they've already pre-cancer decided that that's not part of their relationship or it's not something that is a part of their quality of life, then of course they're less likely to, to want to address those problems uh, after a treatment for cancer. But it's certainly important for patients, partners to understand that um, that adjustment takes time, patience, being flexible, um, physical recovery and healing is a process. It's, it's not an end point. Um, absolutely, um, each person in the relationship has fears, anxiety, questions. That's why, again, I think about these problems as a couple's problem. And I always try to involve the partner or the spouse in that sexual counseling that I do. And then open, uh, honest and open uh, mutual communication is, is absolutely so important. That's probably the most important uh, aspect of, of good sexual health. In, and in this sort of new normal, reconsidering um, sex and intimacy, there are some things that patients will often say, um, things like, if I don't have intercourse, it's not, quote, normal sex. And I, I try to disabuse them of this notion, sort of explore with them. Uh, what it is that um, is meaningful to them and, and in the relationship, but also as an individual. Um, again, this idea that a, a woman's life, a sex life ends with menopause. Um, is that in fact the case? Are we talking about intercourse? Are we talking about intimacy, emotional intimacy, physical intimacy? Things again, if I can't have an erection, it, there's no point in having sex. Um, 
So again, just some some uh, sometimes I'll refer to these as as myths, if you will. Um, is it in fact true that a woman's sex life ends with menopause? Is it true that sexual activity is only for young, healthy individuals? Um, does being affectionate with a partner always have to lead to sex, or does it? Can it simply lead to a closer emotional intimacy, some affection? Um, so again, some myths around uh, sexual health that I um, work with patients to um, identify and and to work um, with. So there are some other things as well, um, and we've listed them here. Um, one of the things that that I will sometimes hear from patients is, you know what, there's a lot going on. I know they mentioned something about the effect of, of this particular treatment on my sexual functioning. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to wait until all of this is over. Um, it's better that I just not think about it until uh, after it's over. And I, I often discourage that um, because sometimes that builds a wall. Uh, between partners and their questions, there's anxieties. And so again, that communication all along the way about what's happening and, and how they might address these things. Um, so again, just some myths uh, around this, uh, this topic. So what I'm going to do now is, is to kind of walk us through um, the sexual response. And, and it, it, we talk, to talk about sexual desire or libido. Um, this is probably the most common sexual problem uh, for cancer patients. Um, what it means is that a woman or a man absolutely doesn't experience a spontaneous physical desire uh, to be sexual, but it doesn't mean that a person can't respond sexually. Um, so enjoying pleasurable sensations of being touched can help the body to, to begin to respond sexually. It kind of jumpstart or increase desire. And this is the idea, uh, or this idea is, is called responsive desire. Uh, so again, you may have lost that spontaneous drive uh, because of the various therapies, because you're, of your experience, because you're anxious or distressed, but that doesn't mean that you can't respond in a way that may fuel uh, more desire, more interest in sexual activity. Um, oftentimes patients will say in many ways, you know, I'm just, I, I, I'm not motivated. Uh, so I'm just gonna wait until that motivation comes. And I always work with them to understand that oftentimes it's, if we waited to be motivated, we'd be waiting a long time. It's, it's actually can be more uh, constructive, more productive to, go ahead and, and act, and that, um, in, in this case, act sexually, and you may find, oftentimes we'll find that the motivation actually follows, so motivation follows action. Um, so this idea that motivation follows action uh, is really important, but I, I will say that when we think about motivation, um, what I encourage patients to do, patients and partners, is to think about what does motivate you to want to be close to your partner? Uh, what motivates you to want to be sexual? And I've heard all sorts of things. I, I remember one woman who shared with me, um, I want to reward my husband for, you know, and, and literally in this case, it was, I want to reward my husband for taking out the trash. I didn't have to remind him. It was wonderful that I didn't have to do that. And I wanted to reward him. Um, that was a motivating factor for her. That wouldn't work for everybody, but it worked for her. Um, so this idea, again, of, of what motivates you to want to be uh, close to your partner, uh, to be sexual with your partner. So we're kind of breaking down uh, the elements of desire. Um, when it comes to sexual desire and sexual arousal, uh, really the, the can't say enough about sexual thoughts, fantasies. Uh, and these are fantasies that a person does not have to share with his or her partner. Um, absolutely not. But probably the best sort of example or analogy here is if you think about um, as we get older, life gets more complicated. Uh, and that's just because, again, there's, there's school, there's job, there's partnerships, there's families, there's there's um, job losses, there's illness. And so things get really more complicated. And so there's a reason why when they do studies among um, adults, Saturday night is the period of time or the time when 
couples are most sexually active. Okay, most people are not, not, not all, but certainly a good number of people are not working on Saturday. There's, um, you know, they, they're not working the next day. It's the weekend. They may be more relaxed. So they're able to set aside some time to be sexually active. Um, and then the phone rings and you suddenly go to, okay, where, where are my kids? They're, they're, this one's here and that one's there. And so you've got to be able to focus the mind. And you can do that through sexy thoughts, sexual fantasies, turning off the phone, making sure you know where your children are, they're well accounted for, um, but setting aside some time. So again, um, being able to focus the mind is so important when it comes to desire, when it comes to sexual arousal. We th think about sexual satisfaction uh, used to be that we think, and this was borne out in some of the research that was done, that satisfaction means having an orgasm, achieving or obtaining an orgasm. When in fact, when we step back, sexual satisfaction is, can really be much, much more uh, broad, uh, much broader than the ability to achieve an orgasm. That may play a limited or even no role. And it has to do, sexual satisfaction may have to do with uh, various relationship factors, how committed the individuals are to each other, the importance of, of sexual activity in the relationship, attitudes towards illness and aging, um, I'll share with you a, um, a, just a very brief uh, uh, anecdote. I had a, I was doing a talk several years ago, um, and a gentleman came up to me. He was in his 80s, and he said, I, you know, he said, my wife and I are not uh, sexually active. He said, we leave that to the younger folks. He said, I've had prostate cancer. My wife has Crohn's disease, and she has an ostomy. He said, but I'll tell you what we do do. He said, we lie in bed. Um, and hold hands and we share our memories. And as he was talking with me, as he was sharing with me, it just struck me as an incredibly intimate experience uh, for both of them. And they would describe themselves as satisfied. Someone in a new relationship who's a, a young adult may see that as not at all satisfying, but for these individuals who've been married for many years and who had lots of good memories, simply sharing those things and being physically connected um, was very satisfying for them. So in order for individuals and for couples to kind of zero in on satisfaction and what it means, what I will often ask couples to do, um, and individuals as well, is to identify their ingredients for a satisfying non-sexual encounter and a, a ingredients for a satisfying sexual encounter. So it might be things like my partner is focusing his or her attention on me um, when we're having a conversation, so a non-sexual uh, encounter. It might be um, a sexual encounter where the television is off, it's quiet, the, the, the children are in bed, uh, but asking them to identify, uh, actually write down their ingredients for a satisfying encounter, and then sharing those lists of ingredients with each other. And more times than not, people tend to, it's, an, it's a nice communication tool, and more times than not, people tend to find out some things that they might not have thought of, like, oh, a television needs to be off, or again, my phone needs to be out in the other room, different things like that. Um, again, just some examples, but it's an exercise that I will encourage uh, patients and their partners to do. Uh, if if in, in this part of the presentation, if the only thing that you remember is sensate focus, then, then I'll feel like I've accomplished something. This is an old uh, sex therapy technique back from the 60s, actually, originally uh, developed in the 1960s. And if you Google this term, you'll see kind of variations on a theme. Uh, but what it is uh, at its heart is a series of exercises for couples to increase their communication. Um, it's it's done in stages. and um, the, the idea is for each partner to have the opportunity to explore a partner's body through touch and listen as a partner shares what feels best. So initially, it's nonverbal communication and you set aside a, a time, maybe it's, it's an hour, maybe it's 40 minutes, and um, you take turns. So you may be the recipient of touch for the first 20 minutes, and then you are the giver of touch for the second 20 minutes. And initially in that first stage, there's no, um, no genital or breast touching. Um, purists will say there's no verbal communication unless something's uncomfortable or painful. 
um, certainly no intercourse. And it's the idea here is to become reacquainted with your body after all the things that an individual is going through or, or has gone through with the various treatments. And um, so get reacquainted with your body and for your partner to become reacquainted with your body as well. So again, this idea of establishing the awareness of physical sensations, what is pleasurable, what is not, something that may have previously been pleasurable but may no longer be. Um, and then in stage two, you move on to, um, uh, again, no expectation of a sexual response, but you may include genital and breast touching, um, certainly no intercourse, um, but you're just sort of moving up the ladder towards greater intimacy. Um, and uh, you may be able to communicate uh, a desired touch. Um, next slide. In subsequent stages, you continue with that mutual touching. So taking turns still, um, you may move to, and, and this here is, is a little conventional. I, I will tell you, at least what's on the slide is a little conventional in that, um, if we, you know, maybe the, the, the female on top position, again, no expectation of sexual response, but then you may progress to intercourse as agreed. Um, but this will take place when we talk about these stages, we're talking about four, five, six weeks. So oftentimes people are comfortable with this because early on, there's no expectation of any kind of, of sexual a genital touching, there's no expectation of a sexual response. So an individual's performance anxiety or a couple's performance anxiety um, is really very minimal in the beginning. And then there's communication along the way. And I hope certainly at times other than these sessions where you're moving to greater sexual intimacy. Uh, so again, I would encourage anyone to uh, look this up and to talk about um, this series of exercises with your uh, spouse or partner. Certainly, um, this idea of setting aside time um, is consistent with the idea, too, of, of overcoming some physical impairments. So if there's pain, uh, discomfort, what are some ways to address that? It may be as, as uh, straightforward as taking um, your pain medication 30 minutes before any sort of sexual activity. It may be new positions to reduce uh, discomfort or facilita facilitate activity. And, and I, in working with patients, I remember one individual saying, why didn't I think of that? It's a simple thing. And when we talked about a different position and I said, well, I, I've got some distance here. You've got so much in front of you with how you're feeling physically, how you're feeling emotionally, what you're dealing with, multiple appointments and what have you. It's a little harder to, to, to get clarity there. And so working um, with individuals like me, talking with your physician, talking with your nurse, they've got some, some distance from those problems, obviously. And it may be a, a simple solution uh, that you wouldn't have thought of normally. Um, and certainly finding time for sex when symptoms like pain and fatigue can be minimized. So again, it, it may seem like a fairly straightforward, simple thing, but um, things have changed. There may be uh, physical symptoms, physical conditions that are now um, sort of barriers or hurdles to uh, sexual activity. And so you'll need to do some things differently and that's okay. Um, in fact, more than okay, but you also may need to communicate and likely will, absolutely will need to be communicating with each other um, to better understand what's happening and what needs to be done, what might be able to be done to address some of those physical impairments. In general, I encourage patients and their partners to consider a variety of interventions. Um, Dr. Gallen has already mentioned that, that talked a little bit about fertility. Um, I encourage sexual stimulation techniques, absolutely relaxation training, mindfulness, um, reducing the anxiety, talked a little bit about performance anxiety. Um, so addressing uh, head on, what are some of the things that you're concerned about? If it's pain or performance or um, what my partner is thinking, what, I'm, what, what he's fearful of or she's fearful of. Um, so communicating um, with each other, absolutely. Uh, certainly dealing with altered uh, body image. So working um, 
to address changes in physical appearance and your emotional response to those changes. Uh, so again, thinking very broadly about um, ways to address and to enhance uh, sexual activity, sexual intimacy. Um, moving to more specific therapies, I mentioned uh, this earlier, uh, promoting healthy pelvic muscles. Um, this can be for uh, painful intercourse, painful ejaculation, um, for urinary incontinence. And this is absolutely true for both men and women. women uh, men can do Kegel exercises too, um, which I'm sure uh, it's pretty much if, if a person has ever been to a gynecologist, I dare say they would have learned about Kegel exercises, which works the pelvic floor muscles. Many people will often need more than that, and they actually can participate in pelvic floor physical therapy. It's working those pelvic floor muscles. We do have uh, physical therapists here at Moffitt who are trained in pelvic floor therapy um, with the objective of strengthening those pelvic floor muscles and then in increasing blood flow to vaginal or to genital tissues, not only vaginal tissues, but um, penile tissues as well. Some specific therapies for women, um, some self-care to reduce vaginal dryness, irritation, and pain. There are water and silicone-based lubricants. Um, those are typically done at the time of, of activity, um, and I've listed several of those that are available um, here on the slide. Vaginal moisturizers, and vaginal moisturizers work differently. They are to be used really independent of whether there's going to be any kind of sexual activity. And they're typically used, say, three times a week. Um, think about it really as, as you know, many people um, moisturize their skin, their hands, their arms. And it's a similar sort of approach is um, moisturizing the vaginal tissues. And again, I've listed some uh, ones here. Uh, that may be helpful. And I, and I will say, though, that um, what works for one person may not work for another person. Um, the vaginal moisturizers, though, are, um, there's no uh, estrogen in them. There's no hormones in them. Um, they're available over the counter. Um, but they do, and they take several weeks to uh, work, but people who, who stick with them will see some changes, some improvement in um, vaginal dryness over time. Um, topical anesthetics, things like lidocaine cream or ointment, uh, if there's pain with um, penile thrusting, for example, and then local estrogen therapy. This is not the systemic oral hormone th replacement therapy, um, but rather it's a local estrogen therapy. Um, and the importance here is that this, the, there is a little bit of systemic absorption, um, but it's minimal. And so um, working with a gynecologist and your oncologist um, to determine whether or not some local estrogen therapy may be appropriate and is not contraindicated, uh, absolutely uh, may be helpful. Uh, in addition to those uh, lubricants, moisturizers, estrogen therapy, um, oftentimes because uh, vaginal health has a, everything to do with blood flow, getting good blood flow to the vaginal tissues. Um, vibrators can be a useful way, an effective way of increasing the blood flow. These are battery operated. Um, and they also can be used to increase familiarity with your new levels of arousal, alterations in orgasm. I worked with one woman I remember, um, and I, I often hear this, I say, are you able to have an orgasm? And a person will say, "I." I don't know, I haven't tried. And so this is a way um, to see if, uh, or to facilitate that uh, in a new and different way, oftentimes for women who've not used a vibrator in the past. Women who've had pelvic radiation will be familiar with vaginal dilator therapy. Uh, it's a treatment for vaginal atrophy and self-administered, performed uh, minimally really three times a week for 15 minutes. And the results are dependent on patient compliance. I will tell you that nobody likes to use these. They are uncomfortable, but unfortunately they're sort of the best thing going. Um, it, it pulls the vaginal tissues. You can see they're graduated in size and uh, stretches the vaginal tissues to enhance blood flow. Uh, if a person is sexually active and there is penile penetration during sexual activity, that can uh, substitute for using the vaginal dilator. Uh, in addition to that, 
um, there is a device, and it's actually pictured here, it's a battery operated handheld device that is designed to uh, increase blood flow to the tissues. It doesn't stretch the vaginal tissues, um, but it does increase blood flow. Um, again, used three or more times a week for uh, approximately five minutes at a time. Uh, the last thing that are out there, less available and um, really sort of less tried and true, absolutely, is something called, one is laser vaginal rejuvenation. Um, it's probably not going to be covered by insurance, but it's designed to enhance, to, to improve, to, to um, kind of fix the vaginal tissues. Uh, there can be burning and scarring though, so it's really not often recommended. I have had some patients use it though uh, and or receive it, and that's done through their gynecologist's office. Um, I've had a couple of patients who report good results, but I've also heard of other patients who who's have experienced some, some burning and, and scarring. And so that certainly, uh, is a side effect that nobody wants to experience. Um, so it's, it's, it's probably, um, worthy of a conversation, but you may, um, it may or may not be, uh, an appropriate therapy for an individual. In addition to that, there are medications out available for interest and or arousal. Um, not a lot of good evidence on their effectiveness. Osfina, for example, actually does have hormones, um, or excuse me, is a medication that would be contraindicated if you're on hormone therapy. Um, some women, uh, uh, some pro providers actually, uh, not here in the cancer set or in the cancer center, but they will uh, perhaps prescribe some testosterone or even the PDE5 inhibitors that I'll mention when I talk about men's therapies. But there really isn't a lot of evidence, good evidence, uh, of for their effectiveness, but I did want to address um, the fact that they are out there. Um, probably less, uh, I would certainly, um, I think that that we would encourage these therapies less than we would the, the, the other therapies that are, are uh, have been um, available for some time and are uh, more benign, if you will, than these therapies listed here. And then we talk about some therapies for men, uh, the PD-5 inhibitors. Viagra is the one that's been around probably the longest, um, uh, 80s, I think, maybe. Uh, um, I, I should know that. I'm, I'm blanking on it. But there are a number of, of medications available. Um, and this can be done as needed on demand, if you will, if there's going to be sexual activity or low dose daily dosing as a way um, to increase blood flow. Uh, to the penile tissues in a, a sort of penile rehabilitation. The thing that's important to know here, though, is that there still needs to be some physical or psychological stimulation um, in addition to taking the medication. They don't just produce an erection. You do need some stimulation. Uh, and then testosterone for sexual desire. Um, that is certainly not going to be indicated in men with prostate cancer. Absolutely not. Um, but there are other um, individuals or uh, other cancers where testosterone would be appropriate, um, not just for sexual desire, but uh, mood and fatigue, uh, particularly. In addition do that, to that, uh, some devices to treat erectile dysfunction. The, the device that's been around the longest is a vacuum erection device. Um, it's a handheld device. Um, it's used to... Um, and battery operated, it's used to um, uh, facilitate blood flow into the penile tissues. Um, this too can be used uh, for penile rehabilitation, even if a person is not going to have intercourse. Um, certainly if a person is using it um, for uh, intercourse, it's something that's not spontaneous, um, requires some, some planning, if you will. Um, most people use it though for um, just enhancing blood flow, increasing blood flow to the to the uh, penile tissues rather than uh, for uh, a sexual encounter uh, or an, in, uh, an in encounter that would in, uh, involve intercourse. The pharmacotherapies for erectile dysfunction, rather than the the vacuum device, the two things that are more often uh, used is um, either the intraurethral suppository 
And you can see that's the second picture there that's used. A more effective device is penile uh, injection therapy. And that's using a, a very small needle to inject um, medication into directly into the penis um, to uh, produce an erection. That tends to be more effective. The more most effective or more effective uh, approach usually involves a combination of a PDE5 inhibitor and the injection as well. Um, again, there's not a lot of spontane spontaneity involved there. Um, but for couples who are, have good communication and um, are addressing this um, together as a couple, that's, that's okay. That doesn't, the fact that there's no spontaneity doesn't mean that anything other than a, a, a couple needs to be more planful and to be communicating. Uh, finally, the last therapy, and I, I don't have a slide for it, is um, is actual surgery to place a penile prosthesis. In my experience, there are men that undergo the therapy or the surgery to implant uh, a, a pump, essentially, to produce uh, an erection. That there, that there are uh, absolutely that's available um, for uh, men. It's not something that I see a lot of patients take advantage of. Um, more often than not, I hear patients say, I've had enough surgeries, I've had enough therapies, I'll, I'll work with these other therapies, um, but not interested in, in surgery. Um, and I certainly can appreciate that given the, 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 the rigor of uh, various therapies uh, for cancer. That, uh, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you for, for your attention. Um, did want to share, there are two pages of, of references here. Uh, this is Dr. Galligan's and then some additional references that, that I've added, some resources that uh, a person may uh, find to be informative. Um, so very much thank you for your attention and um, the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you so much for that great session today. Um, you can find more information about Meet the Experts and additional sessions by going to moffitt.org slash meet the experts. Take care.